Hello, my name is Dean Kartover, and this is Current Buzz. Today we have Tammy Go Govier. She's a state rep from what district? 14th, is it? 14th, 14th Middlesex. Middlesex, yes. And she's, uh, she recently became a doctor, not a physician, but a, a doctor in public health, right? Yes. That, what, what school was it from? Boston University. Oh, good school. Okay, yeah. good. We got that out of the way. She lives <laughs> in Acton. She's running for lieutenant governor. And we're going to drill down on something that just happened recently. There's been a pact for governor. And the gov lieutenant governor does not do very much in the sense that they... Uh, I, they chair the, gov the governor's the governor's council, council yes. and they back up if the if the governor is sick or out of state, mm -hmm. you take over. Yes. Um, I would ask you why, but I'm going to ask you that later. I want to get down to this PAC. Why our PAC has started in regards to a lieutenant governor, which is a position of people that said goes nowhere, mm -hmm. or, and um, what the heck is this PAC? This PAC was in the uh, Boston Globe, July 21st, 2020, and it says that this uh, uh, person has started a PAC for the, the, the other candidate mm -hmm. against you. Uh, she's a mayor of Salem, right? And I don't, I don't get what's going on in regards to this PAC, why they need a PAC. It's called Mass Independent Expenditures Political Action Committee. Yeah. Explain it to me. What's going on yeah. here? Well, first and foremost, I just want to say thank you. It's been a delight to chat with you a little yeah. bit before we got going here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm proud to be from Lowell and to now represent the 14th Middlesex, which includes parts of Chumpsford. Um, and it's really my experience growing up in the city of Lowell that has inspired me to give back and to pay attention to the issues that matter to working people every single day. So the formation of this particular PAC where we don't know where the money is necessarily coming from, there are folks who are associated with it who are getting involved in a Democratic primary for lieutenant governor here in Massachusetts. And some of the folks who are part of this PAC have you know, been part of making major contributions to the Republican Party here in Massachusetts, as well as to uh, Mitch McConnell, who I believe you know, really is the reason why we have the Supreme Court that we have and why we have had a lot of the challenges that we've had and threats to our democracy. So I have asked my opponent to disavow herself of this PAC um, because of the threats to our democratic principles and right. our values right here in Massachusetts and what it means for um, the voters to be influenced by a PAC uh, that is backed by folks who are a Mitch McConnell-like Republican. Yeah, PACs, are, they call it dark money because you don't know where it's coming from, who's, who, is, who is it coming from. It could come from Europe, it could come from China, it could come from Russia, it could come from South America. There's no control on it. Right. And uh, for a lieutenant governor to have a PAC going, there's something... Uh, wrong here uh, yeah. because it's really not an important position in Massachusetts. Well, it's concerning that folks would um, take this approach to create an independent expenditure. Um, I'm not here to say that the mayor is coordinating with this PAC. We're not allowed to coordinate with independent expenditures. Mm -hmm. I'm not accusing her and her campaign of doing that in any way, shape, or form. Um, but the fact remains that, you know, I do think voters ought to ask themselves, uh, particularly those who lean Democratic or who vote Democratic, why would a Republican-backed super PAC of Mitch McConnell-type Republican PAC want to get involved in Massachusetts' mm -hmm. Democratic mm -hmm. primary mm -hmm. for the lieutenant governor? Well, they want influence. Absolutely. That's, yeah. <laughs> that, that's the bottom line. It's, it's, it's not hard. So uh, there's another candidate. Has he come out against it also? He has also come out against, against the it. formation of the super PAC okay. as well. And I've, I, you know, I've worked against dark money for years. I started the Massachusetts chapter of the Women's March right after Trump got elected to get folks down to D.C. Mm -hmm. And right after that, got to work on trying to overturn Citizens United with a ballot yeah, question. That's a, that's because a, that is also related yeah, to this yes, as well. And we see corporate is. influence really taking over our political decision making. That's the concern I have. It's I, about, I can see, you be separate I, I see a theocracy down the line. I don't but, disagree with you, I, yeah, I, yeah. And that's big concern. I don't want to, yeah. yeah. We're headed that way, right? With uh, the decisions it, of the Supreme it, Court. It's a pre, it, seems yeah. that, it seems that way. And uh, that's why we wanted to separate uh, church from state. We learned in regards to the 18th and 19th centuries of religious wars. Yeah. And that's why, uh, 
forefathers decided that we don't want to mix government with religion exactly. and et cetera. So, exactly. but um, yeah. I digress. No, uh, but I'm with you on that, Dean. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, let's, why, why are you running for uh, lieutenant yeah. governor all of a sudden? I mean, well, you've, you were a rep for two terms, if, if I remember yes. correctly, yeah. Yeah, so I've been a social worker for the last 25 years, okay. as I said, you know, really inspired by my experiences growing up in the city of Lowell. My grandfather had been in the Carpenters Union, so just really have always been advocating and mm. fighting for middle and working mm. class folks mm. um, in our communities and in our state. And in my service in the legislature, um, what I have seen um, on the government side is how we are leaving so many of our hardworking families behind and our small businesses. We have so much bureaucratic red tape that folks have to go through just to get a simple question answered. Um, I saw this as a state representative. I also experienced it as a single mom, uh, just how challenging it is to try to, you're working so hard. People are working you know, sometimes two and three mm -hmm, jobs mm -hmm. just to keep and put food on and the table. And their children are working too. And their children are working. Yeah. And they're still not really getting ahead. And so I jumped into this race 13 months ago, have been crisscrossing the state. And I, I decided to run for lieutenant governor because I also like to get in and dig deep into the root causes of what's driving the issues that we're seeing, rolling up my sleeves. You can do that in the lieutenant governor's role more than you can do in the, in the governor's role because they're out front doing a lot more. I want to form working groups, bring people mm -hmm. in to help us really get at why are we facing a housing crisis? Why do we have a mental health crisis? How do we address climate change? You know, really bringing people in mm -hmm. to not just the same old people who always get tapped for their opinions, but people who have different experiences with our transportation system, with our healthcare system, so that when we're finding solutions, they're actually making a difference in people's lives rather than us assuming what's going to work. Uh, the minutia of things, is that what you The minutia to? of things, yeah. Ac yeah. Ab absolutely. Yeah. And you know, based on my background as a doctor of public health, as a social worker, that's what I'm trained to do. Mm -hmm. I know how to do that. I've done it throughout my career, bringing people together, and want to continue to do that as the second um, in the corner office. Tammy, what should I call you? Should I call you a representative, or should I call you a doctor? You should call me Tammy. <laughs> okay. <All right. laughs> yeah, that's a good one. I, I, I like that. So uh, you said that, uh, let's let's get uh, in regards to um, real estate, mm -hmm. right? In Housing, in Massachusetts, yeah. in the country. Um, uh, I think I read somewhere where we're down by six million homes. I don't, I don't like that in, in the, the whole, whole country. country. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, we're always around 140, 160 units short of what we need in Massachusetts to adequately house everybody. Uh, I it see. fluctuates, but somewhere around there. I see. So um, we recently got um, Ukrainians to come to uh, Lowell or Greater Lowell. Yeah. Uh, which is understandable under the circumstances that they, they're having uh, uh, with uh, the Russian invasion, what I call the invasion, but um, they don't have places to, for them to stay. I mean, yeah. really, even in Lowell. Yeah, I mean, the same thing with the folks from Af Afghanistan. Um, mm -hmm. It's been really difficult uh, to make sure that everybody who has a need for housing is, is housed. We know that seniors are getting crunched. They're being forced to stay in um, houses when they want to be able to downsize, but there's not much places for them to go to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, young families that are just starting out aren't able to break into the housing market. We know that folks who are renting, um, you know, in Boston alone, we've seen rents increase 20% in one year. Wages haven't kept pace with that. So no. that's part of the challenge is, you know the the high rise in expenses when wages haven't kept pace with that with that um, rise. My daughter told me yesterday, the waterfront, mm. not waterfront, seaport. Seaport, right? yeah. Uh, just for a loft, three thousand dollars for rent. I was looking at that literally over the weekend. I was <coughs> in the seaport area for a meeting and saw the same exact thing that your daughter saw. Yeah, uh, five thousand for a two bedroom. <clears throat> Yeah. I was down in the seaport, and I'm looking at these places. I mean, they're $2 million for condos in Massachusetts. I mean, who could afford that? Well, unfortunately, it's not always residents from Massachusetts that are purchasing those, those, um, those apartments or those condos. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's folks who are not even in this country who are parking yeah. their money there. So when we talk about the housing crisis, 
I, f I firmly believe we cannot just build our way out of the housing mm -hmm. crisis. We need to have an increase in supply and protections to make sure that those units go to people who live here in Massachusetts, who will stay in those places and visit the downtown yeah. establishments because our small businesses are the backbone of our communities. But if you're not living in, if you don't have residents that are actually living in those places because mm. they live somewhere else, they're not spending their money locally. This, this is what I want you to do, uh, look into because what happens is there's certain companies, I won't mention it on TV, but there are certain companies in this country who go into neighborhoods overpay for places, yes. uh, inflate the price of what they bought, not specifically in New England, but in the country, mm -hmm. <coughs> overflate the prices. Then what happens is there's other homes that are um, for sale. They buy them, no inspection. Yeah. Imagine that, no inspection of the home. Yeah. And, infl and inflate the price so the price in the neighborhood goes up and up and up where uh, my daughter, your children uh, cannot afford a home exactly. in Massachusetts or anywhere in the country because of the, of the inflation. Yeah, I've seen that and I've, I've talked to, um, there are experts in real estate data Mm -hmm. um, so I first learned of this issue from them uh, last you. year when I was running. I'm and way ahead of the, the curve, huh? You are ahead of the curve, Thank and you. we did start to see the you know the Globe did re report about this a couple a couple weeks ago. Some some similarities, uh, you know, mm -hmm. in sort of observing uh, this this rise and what's driving it. And that's what I mean when getting to the root causes. It's mm -hmm. not we can keep building housing, but if mm -hmm. we still have those dynamics at play, it doesn't help your children, my children, other people's children and grandchildren be able to break into the housing market or, yeah, again, for seniors to be able to downsize. I, I think it's, uh, 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 I shouldn't say it's a scam, but I'm looking for a word. There's something wrong here. Uh, I know in Winchester, yeah. uh, there are certain uh, uh, groups that go into Winchester and pay over 20% of the price yeah. that, that it's listed. And the waiver <coughs> of inspection, like you said, you have to ask yourself who's able to waive inspection and exactly. pay hundred thousand over asking. Yeah, it's not your average worker here. In no, definitely who's not. Able to and, do the, that. and it's yeah. not your average worker that comes from this country, right. or that lives in this country. And it's, it has it's an outside game, and and, and yeah. we're being gamed, actually, in, in my opinion. Yeah, and I, I think that policymaking hasn't kept pace with what this new game is. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm running for lieutenant governor is to lean into the things that I have seen throughout my career mm -hmm. and the work that I've done to say there's something going on here. I've been proactive throughout my career mm -hmm. and identifying just from a little bit of data, we have a problem here. Let's get to work on addressing that issue. So I'll mm -hmm. give you an example. When I was the executive director of Tobacco Free Mass, I said to folks, listen, E-cigarettes are here. People are saying it's a wonderful thing. This was back in 2013, mm -hmm. right? When we thought, okay, e-cigarettes, it might be able to get people off of smoking traditional um, nicotine, tobacco, cigarettes. I said, they're using a playbook though. This is corporate America that is going to come in and buy these e-cigarette companies. That's exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. And now they've hooked our young people onto their products. And I hear of teachers and parents every day, um, not right now during the summer, of course, but you know during mm -hmm. the school year, just how many kids are in the bathrooms um, using vape products and it's impact in their health. I, I think that subsided from what I've seen, but um, I'm talking five, six years ago um, that it was a problem in middle school. Yeah. And they would tell the nurses, you know, uh, you know, I vape. I mean, like yeah. it was no big deal. It's like going on online and just saying, hey, you know, I vape and, yeah. and, and people see that. And it's not healthy. It's not healthy. I mean, and so we got to work on a bill to address that. But okay. it was just you know being proactive, looking at what are what are the early indications, what's the emerging data telling mm -hmm. us, and then identifying solutions to start to address that. So mm -hmm. that's what I mean by you know getting at the root causes and then taking that proactive action. That's the kind of leadership that I believe we need in the corner office with the next mm -hmm. governor. Mm -hmm. um, and. You know, we don't need just somebody who's going uh, to the to the local municipalities. We need true state partnerships, someone who can get at 
those big issues like mental health, housing, climate change, child care. And we still have COVID. Monkeypox is now a big issue. Transportation, yeah. absolutely. And making sure our transportation system is safe and reliable and affordable. You know, it was nice to see in Boston yesterday was taxis coming back. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, you have these lifts, mm -hmm. right? And what's the other one? Uber. Uber, Uber and Lyft. Uh, from what I understand, they're in debt. And now they're charging more people. Mm -hmm. And they've sort of cornered the market. And I don't know if there's a, 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 a thing, uh, something going on in regards to the election in November, whether we're going to vote. Whether, no, that, that was kicked off the ballot. Oh, so it was kicked no off question. the ballot. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, good. Because uh, I'm, I'm anti-Uber, you know, yeah. but I shouldn't say that on television, but, you know. But what they've done to people, yeah. because they charge a lot of money on a Saturday night. Mm. If you're going to go to Boston and, and you want to use an Uber, they'll charge you because there's right. not that many Uber drivers. Right. It's you know? Based on the demand. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Demand. That's it. And, yeah. and that's not how it should be. That's why I'm glad taxis are back. Yeah. I like that's taxis. <laughs> yeah. Um, the gas is $9 uh, in Greece, about $9. Mm. Uh, we're paying. It's going down. Do you think the president have, has anything to do with it? You think the governor of Massachusetts has anything to do with the price of gas coming gas? down? Yeah. I don't. I don't think so. I think it's just um, how the markets work, um, how the oil and gas companies work. Okay. Um, that's why I think the price has come down, and I think we'll continue to see uh, it come down as well. Okay. Um, in Greece, what they do, and I'm going to air this out, uh, they tax the, the the size of the engine. Mm -hmm in regards to the vehicle you have. So if you have an eight cylinder, you're paying more money right. uh, uh, to have that on the road, which is only fair because, uh, so they, they use smaller cars and, mm -hmm. and they get their, in, in, you know, if it's SUV, it's a smaller SUV. Right. It isn't, and uh, uh, I want you to uh, submit a bill on that, do the research. <laughs> Or have your we'll take a close research. look at it. It is yeah. something I've bounced around before, yeah. taxing based on the size of the vehicle. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I mean, instead of taxing people in regards to using, uh, and I think the people would rebel against that, just using the car, but going so many miles, and taxing you going into uh, Boston or something like that. I don't think that'll fly in Massachusetts. Yeah. I know they're doing it in New York and South uh, Southern Manhattan or something like that. If yeah, you go the congestion in. pricing. Is yeah, I, th I think, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, miles, yeah. Um, and uh, I think they've used it in, in one or two European countries. Yeah. And what I'd love to do, and I've done this in um, climate change, is there are folks in our state who are really uh, adept at computer simulation modeling, mm -hmm. and they can plug into the system, you know, different policy levers to see what will give you the biggest effect towards achieving your goal without, with the least amount of unintended consequences and mm -hmm. impact on, you know, um, people's everyday living. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that I want to bring into the ways that we're making decisions in our state and bringing in different kinds of experts mm -hmm. than, you know, just someone who has been working in transportation policy for the last 25, 30 years. They definitely have expertise to bring of to course. bear. But if you've been looking at the problem from the same lens for all that time, is there are there things that are missing uh, that we might want to bring into the decision-making process? And, you know, it, it includes things like looking at what does it mean to have you know, in certain areas, fair free transportation, Lowell and Worcester and a number of places are Ooh, playing that around with that. Yeah. And it's working and it, ridership is increasing in those places. And guess what? The buses are leaving and, and arriving on time because people aren't scrambling to find change. And that's going to help us achieve our climate goals mm -hmm. by getting people out of their cars mm -hmm. and onto public transportation because Massachusetts still ranks at the top of having the worst traffic congestion. If we want to keep businesses here and keep the residents here mm. um, and not have a brain drain, we need to make sure that we're addressing those quality of life issues, like the traffic congestion, by oh. making it easier for people to hop like on. Like the traffic congestion and closing the summer tunnel on the weekends. And yes. For four, <laughs> months, and for four months next year. Uh, yeah. Uh, I feel sorry for people who want to travel uh, in regards to Logan and... and I know. I mean, yeah. it's going to be chaos. It's a circuitous route to get there, but yeah, yeah, yeah. they're going to they're going to have to leave three hours before if they yeah. live in this area in the Merrimack Valley. Wow.
And we're having to do that now because we haven't been making the investments in our infrastructure for so long. So we, we, we need to do that. I mean, look at what happened with the Orange Line last week and then the train and the red car that just rolled 800 feet on its own yesterday. I mean, we have some major, major issues. It's called maintenance. Transit. It is definitely called you maintenance, know, yes. If, if you were in the military and you have those problems, you're not gonna have a military very long. Right. You or know. if you own a home and, and your roof is leaking, you're not gonna say, I have a budget surplus, surplus, I'm just gonna keep my money in the bank, you're gonna fix your roof. Yeah. That's something what we haven't done. We haven't been fixing our, our roof along the way. <laughs> or, or any maintenance or, or new furnace or anything like right. that, I mean, that saves money. I mean, you're gonna, you're gonna push the old furnace till you could max it out, so yeah. to speak. So you have to give incentives, but that's, yeah. that's it. Substance abuse, uh, that's a major mm -hmm. problem. Is it peaking or is it lowering or? It's peaking again. Um, it has been peaking for a little while. So this is what I did my doctoral research on. Oh, you did? Opioid policies oh, um, wow. back in 2007. So I, what, what was your uh, thesis? Where did, where, my where? thesis was looking at, um, you know, there's really been a shift over the last two decades around substance use disorder. Mm -hmm. There's more demand for treatment. We haven't kept pace with providing the level of treatment We've had, that people in need. In the last 40 <laughs> years, we haven't kept pace. I mean, We haven't, on. no. Since I was a teenager. Yeah, yeah. So um, it has, it had, over, opioid overdoses have continued to increase. We saw a dip for a little while. It started to go back up even before mm -hmm. COVID. Um, and now there's xylazine, which is on the street. So for a while, fentanyl was an issue. Yeah, now yeah, xylazine. yeah. Which xylazine? I, xylazine I is a, um, it's a horse sedative. Oh, and okay. And it's really I, I'm aware of it, it's yeah. it's really impacting, and it's being found. You know, now upwards of 25 percent of substances. You know, just like fentanyl had yeah, been. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, creeping up for a while, yeah. and then really it was in you know everything from opioids to um, to cocaine to marijuana. So now we're seeing similar kind of. Um, increase and it's it's of concern um, and it's something for us to pay attention to in the public health uh, world um, and making sure that we're putting in place harm reduction policies um, which is something that I've done uh, in the legislature is pass legislation to make sure that we're getting fentanyl test strips out to folks there's oh, also wow. spectrometers which is oh. how we're able to identify the fact wow. that there are different substances now in the do drugs. the police carry that with them or is, I, is it, yeah uh, some of the police because, are, some of the police departments have those yeah. um, and then I, some of the uh, nonprofit agencies that work very directly with folks who are using substances and folks who are unhoused um, they also have the, those I tools see. at their disposal I and that's see. how we save lives so that people are right. more likely to be able to get into treatment. Right, right. Um, Tammy's running for lieutenant governor, and thank you for coming on the show. Thank we appreciate you. Appreciate it very much. Um, what's your staff? If you become a lieutenant governor, do you have a big staff? Or I think I'll get a handful of staff. Oh, okay. Um, I'm really super excited about that and making sure that we have staff in places to, you know, be responsive to the needs of um, of the residents in our state. Um, but, you know, just right now, just focused on getting the message out about that I'm a proactive leader. I'm running to be a different type of lieutenant governor, that I'm really focused on health and well-being and dignity of our residents when we're making policy and programmatic decisions um, to really roll up my sleeves and get to work. Why lieutenant governor? Yeah, I, I, see tremen I see tremendous opportunity to lead from behind the scenes. And, you know, I believe firmly that leaders don't always have to be the person in the front or That's the person true. who's like the loudest in the room or yeah. the most obvious leader, but also being it's a leader. It's called a subtle, the, leader. a subtle leader. A subtle leader, an informal leader, yeah. um, someone who's really uh, working with folks all across the state to address our big issues. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, well, good luck. You live in Thank Acton, you. Massachusetts. You lived in Lowell, Massachusetts. Uh, and uh, you may be getting married soon, too. Is that yep, my yep, understanding? Yep, we good. are. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> Haven't said a date, but that's coming okay. after the election. I have a good idea in regards to uh, honeymoon, where to go. I'm not going <laughs> to on the air, but uh, yeah. uh, definitely. But, you know, thank you for coming on. And, uh,